I'm delighted to be here today with Darren Campbell. Now, if this man needs an introduction, then you, I don't know, I don't know where you've been for the last couple of decades, but certainly. Uh, we're not going to be spending too much time doing introductions because you should have heard of him. If you haven't, then get on Google because you'll soon be in for a treat to read through this man's story. Talking of stories, I've read his book recently, which is out very soon, and it's been an absolute phenomenal thing for me to engage with and to see so early doors. I said to Darren just now off air that I, I honestly, as a, as a fan of track and field, but also as a, as a fan and follower of Darren, I thought I knew more about the man than I clearly did. In this book, it's been incredibly revealing and, and a real a great, great story to, to hear about and so many lessons to learn, especially for therapists, medical staff and people that are around athletes as to what they go through over the course of a journey, not just in a career, but in their lives. So it's been an absolute privilege for us to get Darren what was meant to be live on Therapy Live. We've had to do, we had a few technical issues on the day. So he's joining me now on Zoom. But Darren, thank you so much for, for joining us and, uh, and also for writing this book. How did it come about? What made you start to put pen to paper at this stage? Um, it was a funny one, but uh, the, the gentleman that actually wrote the book for me is a, is called Tristan Feather, and I worked with him at Wasps and Cardiff Blues Rugby. Um, he's like head of performance, and it's always been one of his dreams to write a book, and um, he, he was on my case about writing a different type of book, which was about lessons learned along my journey and different things like that, and it, it just culminated really with the lockdown, um, I just felt like the timing was right. Um, okay. we'd, we'd spoken about writing my autobiography and I just felt after what happened to me with illness in 2018, it just felt like if I didn't get it out of my mind and off my chest <laughs> uh, straight away, I might never do it. And it just yeah. felt, you know, it was important. I've got three kids, so it was important that my kids at some point got to understand my story rather than sit them down and do a story time I, I felt <laughs> I should write the book and that'll be a better way of doing it well yeah it's generous of you because it means that more of us can can understand and experience a little bit about an insight into into your life I'll therefore go right back to the start if that's all right because uh, the, that's where the book starts quite rightly of course as, a, as an autobiography but fascinating origin story if we call it that um, especially around um, your early childhood and and, and prior to really getting stuck into your athletics there were there were times where it could have gone a different way so could you just tell us a little bit about that especially we'll get to the bmx and the puncher uh which you know, <laughs> would be uh, was just an incredible thing to read i think halfway through the first chapter so yeah where did it start yeah um well i grew up on a council estate uh raised by my mother um there was no father figure around and um pretty much how I got into athletics is the story that my mum tells is that she watched me run at my first ever school sports day and she kind of decided from that moment that I was going to be an athlete. Uh, for me, it was when I was about 12 years old, I remember watching the 1984 Olympic Games and watching Carl Lewis win four Olympic gold medals. And it was really from that moment that I was inspired. I just, You know what it was about that moment? It was watching this guy go out, try his best, do his best and if his best was good enough, he got to stand at the top of the podium and get this medal around his neck. And I was totally inspired by that moment. And um, I think that was obviously during the summer, but by the time I went back to school, I was telling everybody that one day I was going to go to the Olympic Games. And uh, yeah, I started practicing my autograph and <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. Um, but yeah, that moment really did just inspire me and, uplift me and just give me the belief that look anything in life is possible you know growing up on the council estate it was difficult at times and there wasn't much money and there wasn't much inspiration so that moment really did make me sit up and go look that's where I could end up if if um, you know I was focused and dedicated and all of those things mm. but I think um, growing up on the council estate you become a product of your environment and mm. a lot of the things that I saw were were negative um and it culminated really in me ending up being involved in gangs and the incident that you're talking about on the bmx yeah i was just i was getting into more and more trouble and getting involved in different things and uh me and my my well my my gang we were on the way to um uh, commit a crime that we shouldn't be committing um but you'll have to read the book to find out what that was but um, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no spoiler <laughs> alerts. Anyway. Yeah, no spoiler alerts. But um, yeah, it was it was crazy. While we're on the way to go go and do that, I just remember looking up at the sky and just going, "Look, this doesn't feel right." And if I'm not meant to do this, you know, show me a sign. I need a sign. And um, as we was riding the bike, um, I ended up getting a puncture, which kind of put the 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 whole thing on hold um, and we paused for a minute and in that minute it really did just make me realize that the path that I'm going on yeah it's it, it's not it's not a positive path um, and sometimes in life you just need you need faith in something and I think that's where my faith comes from and my belief in God and different things like that because yeah if if I hadn't had that puncture on that day at that time would I have gone on to achieve the things that I've achieved? And yeah, I, I just don't think I would have. I think that the the thing observe it, when I was reading it, I think I can understand the fine margins of success within athletics. And I probably think, and I'd been a bit too blinkered as to thinking like, of course, different moments in different people's careers, but actually never mind that prior, the fine margins for you even being a, a success at that stage and what, what could have been if you'd have, got to said scene of crime and, and things that it just would have been such a different story and it's fascinating that fateful moments like that can really really paint an incredible picture and so yeah again please do uh, for those listening you've got to get stuck into this book but that was a, a powerful place for it to start you mentioned carl lewis as an early influence and i wondered um what other what other early influences you had uh, that, that really helped you to to break through because not only these sort of social challenges that you're describing, but also independent of that, it's an incredibly intense, uh, competitive environment. Um, and so, what, what were those? What were those early influences on athletic terms? Um, I, I think um, one of the other people that inspired me was Michael Jordan. Um, I I remember reading something about him being cut from his high school basketball team, and. Um, I, I guess for many people at that point, they probably would have shunned away from basketball and decided that it's not the sport for them. They've been told they're not going to make it. But to watch him go and become the, probably the greatest basketball player ever, still to this day have shoes named after him, you know, um, it, it was an important inspiration. Um, I think also I had a PE teacher who was oh, just just there for me um you know when you grow up on, on a council estate and there is so much negativity and not having that father figure you look at male role models um to see how they can inspire you change you shape you just make you see the world differently and i think my PE teacher was important in that respect um when i told him what when i told him that one day i would go to the olympic games you know, he didn't laugh. He tried to encourage it and and um, give me the belief that, yes, it was something I could do. The, the majority of the other teachers just said, kids like me don't go to the Olympic Games. They spend the majority of, of their lives in jail or dead. Um, so that's kind of the remit that I was given. And, you know, for any young person, that isn't, that isn't good. Um, we need positivity. Um, when we've got no direction and we need people that can help us gain that direction and be show, uh, be, be pushed in the right direction. Um, mm. And I think just that time for me, it just didn't feel like that. It just really felt negative. Um, but I always tried to just grab hold of little positive things and, and hope that they kept me focused. You know, I, I know it's a while back, but uh, can you? Can, I wonder if you can recall whether or not the... Uh, proving the pr proving the doubters wrong or proving your mentors right. Do you remember which of those really fueled the fire more? Um, I would say proving people wrong, um, and at times that can be a detriment <laughs> because <laughs> the drive the drive the drive is too intense, and sure. it's obviously using a negative energy, uh, using something negative to try and drive you. So. Um, but no, for me, it was always trying to prove people wrong. Uh, if I was told that I couldn't do it, which again, isn't great when you're in gangs and if you're told you can't do it, you know, you always mm. believe you can do it. So it has its positive and, it, and its negative. 
But um, yeah, no, for me always it was trying to prove people wrong. And so with um, with that, I know as you know our audience is predominantly sort of say therapists, medical staff that are in and around sport and are helping people per- pursue pursue their goals in performance terms, but also trying to climb back from say injuries or setbacks or illnesses. And so I wondered if, if you had any early interactions or if you have any first memories of sort of interacting with with therapists and medical staff, regardless of whether they were positive or not. Yeah, um, yeah. Obviously, being a sports person, you you the reality is when you push your body, then there's a high chance that you're going to get injured. And I think, um, yeah, from an early age, you interact with therapists. Um, some of them are very good. I think the first probably time I interacted with a therapist, I was probably about 13, 13, 14. Um, I pulled a, a something. I, I think it was my hip flexor. Um, and that set me out for, for a while. And yeah, I think the thing with therapists, you put in a lot of trust in them um, and you put in a, a lot of belief. You, you need to have a belief that this person can fix you. And it's often difficult to, to find the right therapist. I think, um, I guess the negatives that I had was when I was a little bit older. Um, I've been involved in a car crash. I was around the age of 18, 19. Um, I tilted my pelvis and yeah, um, this, this, this therapist was supposed to be the top therapist. And when I went to see him after a couple of times, he um, pretty much started talking to me about uh, taking drugs, uh, illegal drugs. Um, and that kind of forced me to retire from the sport. Um, as I say, the interactions that I'd had with therapists up until that point had been so positive. But all of a sudden, I was put in this situation where I was being coerced, really, to cross the line. And I always remember the saying that my mum had always said to me. She said, the day you feel that you need to take drugs to be the best, stop. It's not that important. And um, it really did break my heart. Um, myself and athletics it it was a love affair and at that point it it, it really did make me feel like and it was more because of what they said they said the only way I could get to the top is if I did what everybody else was doing and that was take drugs and um, yeah like I say at that time at that age I decided to walk away from the sport and that's kind of how I got involved in in football and started playing semi-pro football how did they, because you mentioned trust and, and your first interactions with the therapist, you were recognising that you are trusting them quite a lot and therefore that became part of it. So to the, have your trust betrayed that way, did it, you know, was it was it a particularly powerful moment because it wasn't like a random stranger that you'd just met that wasn't you know, involved in your care? I imagine that it kind of cuts even deeper than a, than a sort of random stranger or even a, a coaching figure when it's someone within a medical team that, that I imagine cut through and in the book of yeah. course you describe it as such yeah 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 definitely because this is somebody who I'm supposed to look up to I'm supposed to respect who has my career or has my body in their hands and what you what you hope is that they have the knowledge and the understanding to help you get through this sticky period that you're going through. I think it's difficult for therapists, uh, very, very difficult for therapists because they they are, or they tend to be used when it's negative. Um, <laughs> sure. yeah. So it's always, starting, it's always starting from a negative point of view. Um, yeah. So in that, a therapist you hope will bring that positivity and that understanding um, that they can help you get through this, through this negative moment. Um, So once, once it went negative, then from the drugs point of view, the whole thing just felt, just felt, yeah, disappointing. It was heartbreaking. Mm. It was heartbreaking. Yeah. One of the things. Because I'd already, I'd already had success. I was already European junior champion. (laughs) Um, I'd been, I'd finished second at the World Juniors um, in the 100 and 200 metres. So I'd already had success. So I was already on a, on a very good path. But then to have this, this therapist, yeah, just, yeah, just, I guess 
break the whole dream. That's how it felt. It felt like the whole dream was broken because I believed that I could do it the right way. And all of a sudden, here I am with a therapist trying to heal, trying to get better. And they're bringing negative, negative uh, thought processes into it. Because obviously you never succumbed in that direction, but did it ever... Did you ever believe them? Did you ever think, actually, maybe they have a point and, and, and that I, I would need to go down that route to succeed? Did it ever cut through at that point and make you feel like maybe they, whilst I'm not going to go that way, but I wonder if they are right and I do need to go that way if I was to be the best? Well, maybe that's why I walked away. Um, maybe at the age that I was, um, yeah, it, it for me, it as I said, because of what my mother had said, then. Um, you know, that was the thing that rang in my brain. That was the alarm bell that rang. Hold on a minute. I've, I've almost been pre-warned about this this situation, and here I am in it. Um, and yeah, my mum had always said walk away. So there was no way. I guess I could be coerced in that respect. Um, you know, growing up on the council estate, maybe the therapist thought I was that kind of kid that would go that way. But I'd already seen too much in my life and understood <laughs> the pros and cons of situations. And this was a, a situation that I was going to get involved in in any way, shape or form. So I think that's what made it so heartbreaking. Mm. And so, yeah, you, you then you then go into into football and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, no doubt ter- terrifying defences with your pace at that point. But, but then what... Uh, we're fortunate. All of us are fortunate that, that it, then then you were drawn back. What 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 sort of what sort of turned that around? Um, I was I was playing football and um, it was the athletic season um, summer and I was just watching the British Championships on TV and uh, two athletes that I used to race against when I was younger finished second and third behind Linford Christie and I just remember watching and thinking. I should be there, um, you know. Yes, I'm enjoying football, but I'm never going to be at the top in football. Um, in that respect, I'm always realistic and honest. And yeah, as I say, I didn't feel I was going to ever make it to the top in football. But as an athlete, I'd kind of got to the top for my age group. So maybe... I needed to go back and it was just the feeling I had that just made me just, yeah, just made me feel that I was wasting an opportunity. Um, But it was watching that race, just watching, as I say, those two guys finish second and third. It just made me feel like I need to be back there. You know, I used to beat those guys, so I need to go back. And I remember um, a couple of months later, I, I gave Linford Christie a call to see if I could train with him. And he said, no, he said, uh, you're not serious enough. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember saying, look, I know I haven't always been as serious as I've, as, as I've needed to be, but um, I now feel ready and I feel ready to go. So, you know, if you give me the opportunity, um, I'll, show, I'll, I'll, I'll prove you wrong then. I guess we're right there again. I'll prove you wrong. Um, but it was actually my agent that I had to call in the end who convinced Linford to let me come back and train with him. Because right. that's that's something I think that, especially in pop culture terms, you really seem to be uh, bursting on the scene in many ways. Those that were close to athletics obviously followed your junior career and stuff, but when you were then the, the fledgling, um, especially training with Linford, et cetera, it was something that really broke through in pop culture terms where people were really starting to think, wow, this is, uh, this is potentially that next generation. What was the, uh, you, you're already accumulating people that you're trying to prove wrong. But one of the things that seemed to happen in and around that time is that you emerged and then continued to be famously a championship athlete. You peaked at the right times. It was, it was something that you've got people that uh, just increasingly, no one would even dare write you off at any given time because you, your, your timing was, was impeccable. And, and that's, not an accident from reading your book like your your, your uh, concentration and the way that you paced things was 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 immaculate so how did that come about and 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 how did you then manage to to time things so so brilliantly through your career uh well i think initially it was by making a mistake a big mistake so 
uh, as I said, I, I came from football and literally I trained for nine months and I made the 96 Olympics. And in my mind, I thought I'd made it. You know, it probably came too easily and too soon. And um, I didn't think I was going to be selected for the four by one relay. Um, got a knock on the door the night before saying that I was running third leg. Um, unfortunately, in that relay race, um, I dropped the baton and I just remember feeling so low, um, so exposed. And yeah, there was an incident where Denise Lewis had a few words with me and different things like that. <laughs> Again, you'll have to read the book, but yeah, she crops yeah. up, she crops up a few times, doesn't she? With some words, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and um, I just, I just remember feeling so low that I didn't want to feel that way ever again. Um, I knew I'd made mistakes. Um, I knew I hadn't been as focused uh, as I should have been. And I think going back to when I was younger, the dream was to stand at the top of, po of the podium and I enjoyed winning medals. So first and foremost, I loved winning medals. So that had been instilled in me from a young age. So after making that mistake in 96, I just kind of decided from there that I would have to step up my game and my main focus would be championships because I've just failed in a championship um, and the mm. biggest championship of them all for any athlete, the Olympic Games is, is the biggest competition. So having failed in that respect, yeah, I didn't want that feeling again. So mm. it was a, a culmination of a few things. So obviously I loved winning medals and then it was the attention to detail I was solely focused on the championship. So whether that be world champs, Europeans, Commonwealth Games, Olympic Games, I would be focused on that championships. So it would mean at times during the season, I wouldn't be in great form. Um, I'd go into the British championships, not where I would want to be because my mindset was always, if I can't finish in the top three, then I don't deserve to go to the big championships. So all, all my all my thought process was about that championship and peaking at that championship. So I never peaked at a British champs. <laughs> mm -hmm. I always went there. I always went there under cooks and under pressure and under stress because I knew physically I wasn't ready, but mm -hmm. I would have to use my mental strength. But if I could get through that, then I could get myself physically ready for the major championships. My feeling was I could only peak once. I couldn't peak twice in the season. Um, I think that's difficult to try and do that twice. So for me, it was always about just peaking at that major championship. And as I say, after what happened in 96, I go into 97 and, uh, and we win a relay bronze medal at the World Champs. And then from there, you know, um, 98, then I become European champ, and win two medals there and it just keeps going. Um, <laughs> I'm just focused constantly on, on winning these medals at championships and making finals. One of the things that, because at, at that point it was certainly, uh, and then this is where it, certainly my, my memories start to, to really come online following athletics at the, at the time. And I, it, it made it really box office because people were, you know, commentators, et cetera, would be ruling you out and well, season's best is poor at the moment. And then boom, it's, it's as soon as the heats kick in for the championships, it was, and it made it, I think that's one of the things that really raised your flag again in pop culture is because it was always this, how can the same person be surprising us every time? And it was because you, you were always peaking at the right time. I wonder just to touch base with the therapist piece and thinking that in the book, it's like there is a bit of a, a gap in which it's, it, it, it's um, there's a lull in which it doesn't really come up as much, the medical team, the therapist, et cetera. And I wondered, is that in part because of that distrust that you'd had for a time? And, and did that trust then build back up as you, as you went back into, into the sport and started to encounter, hopefully, uh, less unscrupulous therapists? Yeah, um, well, then I, I, I created a team. So because of what happened to me then, um, my therapist would be a part of my team. Um, not that I wouldn't trust the uh, athletic therapist, but I would always try and find mm. somebody who first and foremost were focused on me um, yeah. and believed in me. Uh, I think that was very important. And, um, you know, 
there was a gentleman in South Wales called John Sales and he was very much into Chinese medicine and he would come on the circuit and travel with me and you know um, he knew my body but also I knew him I think that that became the most important thing we're a team and the therapist is the most important part of your team apart from the coach obviously but the therapist probably has the most pressurized job um, out of everybody uh, that you're around because if I've trained for 11 months so 10 months for this championship so then all of a sudden I pick up a nickel that person has to have the belief that they can heal me that they know the right things to make me better they know the right things to say um, to keep me positive because you know once you pick up an injury then the whole mentality changes you go from this positive person to this negative person because you want your body to heal tomorrow you know and um it's it, it's just yeah. it's just not realistic but it's in not that, quite as simple as that unfortunately is it but, no it's yeah. not but your therapist can give you that belief that actually can fix you tomorrow why because he knows you inside out and uh, i would say to any any therapist have a relationship with the people that you work with um you are going to be a sounding board because yeah, whilst that person's getting treatment, they'll talk to you about different things, maybe home life, different things like that. Sure. But it's it's always important that you embrace that because during the lowest moments, during that negativity, when the athlete doesn't believe they can heal, that's where you're able to step up because you know that person inside out. And that's mm. what I always felt was important with the therapist. Um, and I had, I had a few different therapists that I would work with. I worked with a guy in Germany called Dr. Molly Wolfart. Um, he was the Bayern Munich and Germany team doctor. Right. Um, Brian English, he was the British Athletics team doctor. Um, fantastic relationship with him. And it was all about relationships for me. Um, sure. Once I'd been through those situations um, previously, it was always about what lessons did I learn? Um, and how could I get things right? Uh, but knowing the therapist inside out and the therapist knowing the athlete inside out, that would be what I would say to anybody is paramount. Brilliant, because I, I think that that's something, I've seen some fantastic therapists that, that, are, that are incredibly smart, great application of their skills, but they, they stop short because they think there needs to be a very professional distance between them and, say, patients. And in certain contexts, you can understand that, especially when you've got yeah. sort of it. It, but that's the difference, especially, um, and we've heard from other athletes on the show at Therapy Live that were saying that in in sport, but especially in elite sport, you don't want to overblur those professional boundaries, especially with regards to confidentiality, et cetera. And unfortunately, you've encountered some really unscrupulous clinicians that then uh, can be then obviously verging on the illegal. But it's just that unless you guys can trust each other intimately and then and then it just doesn't work and so setting too too much of a distance because of professionalism means that you don't get the outcomes you need so it, it's it's been a fascinating commonality really between all the athletes the same what you've said where that relationship is is 90 percent of it even one person had said and so it's it's fascinating for you to to repeat that would you when it comes to you that that's what sounds like your top tip for, for therapists what would you say would be a real do not do this. You know, if, if you had to say you know, to any, any therapist of any, uh, be that up and coming or established, do not make this mistake, what would it be? Um, I guess don't underestimate the power that you have on, on, on an athlete. Um, it's the relationship. It's, it's really going back to what I just said earlier. The relationship for me is, is, 78% of it, you've got to have that relationship. But, and, and more importantly, don't, as a therapist, don't doubt yourself. An athlete can feel when a therapist doubts right. themselves. Sure. <laughs> you okay. can feel it. You can feel that negative energy or okay. you can feel that, that, that doubt coming from the therapist. Right. So, you know, always remember, you know more than the athlete. So in that, don't be afraid to show that. Um, don't doubt yourself. Um, you know, for, for a sports person, we go out and compete and that's one of the things that we, we're not supposed to do, doubt ourselves. We're supposed to believe in ourselves totally. So I'd say to any therapist, just believe in yourself, you know, have no doubt that you can heal this person. Um, you know, a funny, 
a funny situation happened to me in Athens when I got injured. And it wasn't until, well, it wasn't until three months later that the doctor, Brian English, told me that I probably shouldn't have run. So... <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm, I'm really, I'm really conscious not to pull the brakes because the Athens stuff I really want to get stuck into with you in in a second because it's just a fascinating journey, both both like medically, physically, but also just that you know what a what a uh, what a time you know that's a really interesting uh, part part of the book. But just before we do, especially um, weaved throughout the book, you're really quite open about your mental health as well as some of the social features and factors that affected your life. And I think that that was something that um, it really came through throughout the book, but particularly there was no distinction made between these things affecting, you know, it, it was difficult for these things to not impact on your performances, the way you were feeling, the just general enjoyment of, of, of both work and life. And, and so, you know, th- th- I imagine that was quite an exposing experience to to not just put that onto paper, but obviously when when going through it, when you look back, how involved were those factors in your well being as well as your health and performance? Um, well, I think always the injury came first, and this is why I say the relationship that you need to have with your therapist mm. uh, becomes important. So the injury came first, and all of a sudden, I'm not able to do what I love. Um, I'm not able to do the job that I I love. Um, So straight away, that then has an impact on on my personal life. But for me, that's what it did. It would then have an impact on my personal life because I'd be so engrossed with with wanting to heal and get better that it created depression. Um, And, you know, probably the worst incident that I had was Oh, 2001. So I just won Olympic silver in 2000. So you're on a high. Um, going into 2001, then I'm thinking, right, I'm gonna, you know, do these amazing things, and then I pick up an injury that pretty much rules me out for the whole year. Um, I basically tore the insertion of my hamstring, mm-hmm. and every time I tried to come back, it, I just kept re-injuring it. So um, that that really. I've gone from the highest of the high to the lowest of the low. There's no, there's, there was no middle ground. So, yeah, initially I'm injured. Then I, um, uh, I end up in a situation where my relationship uh, with my partner breaks down and I'm suicidal. Um, I'll, I'll be totally honest about that. I remember the Commonwealth Games were coming in 2002 and I remember just feeling like not only have I missed 2001, then, then also I'm not going to be able to compete in the Commonwealth Games. And those Commonwealth Games were, were in Manchester, which is my hometown. And at one point, I just remember just being in my car and, yeah, just knowing that I wanted to take my own life and I knew exactly how I was going to do it. And I, and I think that was the scariest thing. As an athlete, you visualise uh well, not always, but you visualise your performances, you visualise your training, you visualise so many things. And for me to visualise that, yeah, that was the lowest point. That was the lowest point. Um, but again, you know, therapists, good people around me. Um, it was at a time when mental health really wasn't spoken about. So there wasn't a, a psychologist or anybody to go to mm. to speak with. And maybe I was too closed with the respect of, I probably could have tried to seek out one, but I wasn't aware then in that respect. Mm. So again, my, my, my therapist um, became my psychologist um, and that's why the team around me was very important to me. Um, I didn't go out to just be successful for me. I went out there to be successful for the whole team. Everybody right. plays a part. I'm just the person that goes out and does it. But without everybody's support, you just can't get through these 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 yeah down moments. Outside of that, because because that's the uh, God forbid if there'd have been therapists and, and medic medics that were keeping a dis too far too much of a distance from you, mm. uh, then that and, and treating you as if just a you no know, mechanics fettle in a car, then they would never have uh, never have been able to offer that emotional support that you needed at that time. 
Um, how how well integrated and understood do you feel? And um, because it seems to coincide, and you make that clear in the book that these instances were it was a bit chicken and egg with regards to the the injuries would would create dep- depressive episodes, which would create challenges at home, which would then feed into dif- difficulties recovering from said injury, and it was like a spiral. And how well understood was that, or was it still the blinkers were on said? very important hamstrings for sprinters. Like how much do you feel that those complex phenomena around your life were being accounted for at that point in time by therapists and medics? Yeah, I, th- I don't, again, because I have people close to me, then I would have certain discussions so they would know what was going on in my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is why I say uh, it's important. The, the relationship becomes important because if I didn't, if I wasn't able to speak about it with anyone, then how much worse would that have been? Um, as I say, because I trusted the therapist, then I would let them into my world a lot more than I would let an outsider. Um, if it had just been a random therapist that maybe UK Athletics had gave me and I see them fortnightly or once a month or whatever, I don't think the relationship would have been the same, but because it was somebody who I felt was part of my team, even though they saw other athletes, that's fine. But when I was there, I felt like the most important person in the room. That's the important bit. It's feeling like you're the most important person in that room at that time. Um, You understand that they're going to have relationships with other sports people. And sometimes maybe those relationships will be closer. But whilst you're on that treatment table, you have to feel like the most important person. And look there'll be times when you want to speak about it and there'll be times when you don't want to speak about it and that's where a a good therapist will understand (laughs) uh, you know not to go too far then with regards to the conversation because there were times when I I literally just wanted to go lie on the bed get the treatment maybe fall asleep (laughs) whilst getting the treatment then there'll be other times where maybe you know my my character was uh, much cheerier then and you know we could have a conversation and so it's understanding it's understanding when that person was is up and when that person's down and knowing the right things right. to say at the right time important i mean if that emotional intelligence is t- tough to teach but so vital uh because yeah, if you get that if you get that mixed up and you start thinking that you can have a, a deeper meaningful at a time where you know that that can be the the, the deal breaker for for athletes. Yes. Uh, if you get that if you get that wrong and pace it wrong. Um. When when then uh, coming through that, um. It was it was uh, fascinating to to read because there were not just individuals but almost organisations and federations that were being less thoughtful and empathetic than your close team because partly they didn't know, but also because at that point you are almost the name and a number on a spreadsheet and they uh, especially like funders and sponsors and things like that though those external pressures how protected were you able to be by your team from those sorts of forces because not only did you of course come back you, you came back stronger in time yeah I, I was protected really well um, and I think it goes back to what we were discussing earlier with regard to me peaking and preparing for competition so because I built that reputation where I always performed well or I always peaked at the right time. It meant that people gave me that space. So it, you mm-hmm. kind of create this thing where it's never over till it's over. <laughs> and, in, <laughs> and in my case, you know, the Commonwealth Games again showed that um, I'd gone from missing a whole season to starting the season and not running very well to ending up leaving the championships with a gold and a bronze medal. And it's like, you know, even for me, how, how'd you do that? Um, but again, it's it, it, it's putting together the mental and the physical. Um, and that's where the team were paramount. Without the team, there's, yeah. there's no way, there's no way I could have done it. Um, yeah. As I say, I'm just the person that goes out there and performs, but everybody plays their little part or big part, depending on what situation we're in. Um, so with regards to sponsors and stuff like that, I wouldn't worry about that. I never worried about stuff like that because I always had that belief that, okay, given half the chance, I might be able to pull something out. I just didn't have doubt. Yeah, well, you're going to say you've kept proving it. You kept, it was almost that was the, eventually at that point became the norm. You know, you were like, 
Yeah. Well, why would they? Yeah. Be, why would they be worried? I'm not worried because I know when the championship is, which is <laughs> pretty cool. Yeah, you're yeah, justifying yeah, the yeah. swagger almost there, aren't you? Then? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You are. It's 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 a crazy thing, but yeah, you re- you really really are. It's um, it's crazy. It's crazy thinking about it, but yeah, that that is what you 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 do in them. Look, it gets to the point where other athletes realize that you know in the championship there's going to be one less medal because you're there. So again you've even managed to imprint something in their mind, which sure. gives you an extra, an extra bit, you know? It's a really interesting point because, yeah, you've, you've almost, you've proved yourself enough for them to give you the leeway to say, look, all's well here. You know, you, you don't, don't compare me to Joe Boggs because this is what we do here and, and, we, and we peak at the right times. But then Athens, that's where I wanted to get to, right? Because that's a, a sort of a, a pinnacle in many different ways ways but we talked a bit about hamstrings and uh and and that's uh that's a relevant piece of that jigsaw puzzle coming up to the olympics and you you know we, we've said about it at, at sydney and the, and the silver at sydney uh, that, that championship athlete that turned up there in, in with, with with bells on so we're building then to the olympics in in athens talk, talk me through the the running and, and what was going through at that point well i would say athens was where so the, the, the training camp was in Cyprus. So I would say leading into Athens was where I fully understood all the different intricate aspects of everything. I felt, I felt like the best version of me then is the, is the best way to explain it. Um, just the attention to detail. I took training partners out to the holding camp. Um, I had therapists who were part of the... Uh, GB team so it was like I had the best of the best around me and um, I just remember the the final training session in Cyprus I I remember getting there and just not feeling 100% um, everything up until that point had gone amazingly well um, but yeah my body didn't feel right and then on the final run um, of the final session I, I I tore my hamstring um, and I just remember lying on the track and Linford was there and yeah, a lot of tears were shed because it felt like it was over, but the type of person I, I am, I wasn't ready to give up. Um, and this is, yeah, this is where I was saying earlier that the doctors, the doctors said that I probably shouldn't have run. But at the time I just said, can I heal? <laughs> I haven't got enough time to heal and um, they were like yeah, yeah, you have and this is what I mean about having that belief in yourself as a therapist, it's never over till it's over and all an athlete ever wants is that you give 100% um, to helping them get better so yeah, he, he pretty much told me I, I would heal and um, I was able to step on the line for the this is probably about five, six days later. Uh, I was able to step on the line um, for the first round of the 100 metres. In my mind, I'd kind of gone, right, I've heard people say when you fall off a horse, that it's important that you get back on that horse as soon as possible. So for me, it was like, I need to get rid of the fear of re-pulling this hamstring as quickly as possible. So I went out for the first round of the 100, got knocked out, but I was okay with it because the time was okay. And I knew I didn't push myself to maximum. Um, but there was no point in trying to test it in training um, because you're not going to put the same amount of effort as if, uh, obviously, you're in an Olympic 100 metre heat. Mm. So by the time I run the 200 metres, I make it to the semi final, uh, get knocked out in the semi final. But all this time, the hamstring healing gets stronger. I've got different therapists working on me. Dr. Muller Wolfart's out there. Brian English is out there. A therapist that I know from Australia, he happens to be out there as well. So I've got these guys working on me literally 10 hours a day, uh, just working on me, working on me, massages, injections, just everything to try and get me back on track. And then unfortunately, uh, after the 200 metres, Michael Johnson says, on TV that I'm faking injury and um, I just lose my mind. Um, I'm not that kind of guy to go out there and fake injury. If I'm not running well, then I'm not running well. It's, you know, that's the way I've always been. 
So that was, I very, been... that was very public. I mean, it's something that yeah. wasn't that it was said in passing and people moved moved no. on. Like that was he even before your TV. response. <laughs> exactly. It was it was a big, a big and 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 public claim for him to to make. It's not the first time his name had come up necessarily in the book, though, was it? Because I think that, that was what gave it such context is that this was someone that you had a, a good relationship I looked up to. with. You, yeah. yeah, I looked up yeah. to, I asked for advice during my career. You know, he was somebody that I, I had a lot of respect for. So Brian English then goes on TV and shows my scan to show that I, you know, this is where it went where, again, you know, my therapist is defending me on TV. It's just like, crazy 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 um but i kind of get to the, the the situation where i'm debating whether to keep going or not or just go yeah. home because because of what he said i'll be honest with you i was ready to fly back to the uk so the night before telling uh british athletics that i was gonna fly fly home i end up going to a party and michael johnson's there so there's a bit of a confrontation but you'll have to read the book <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna say, I wonder if he's gonna gonna go there. But yeah, there is, there is a, there is a confrontation. The puncher was one place that we started in terms of fine margins. That's another fine margin. And now we needn't give too much of a spoiler, but let's just say it, it, it was, it was close to being a uh, sliding doors and moment, right? Yeah, yeah, it's sliding doors. It's one of those situations where you turn left, this will happen, and if you turn right, that'll happen, and. I can only I mean, give but, it did it, but, but this is what's interesting, right? So it, it didn't. You didn't go home. You you you. It's well, after that, they... that, that's that's the crazy thing. So after the after the the decision was made on on whether I turn left or right, I just felt the only way again is to prove people wrong. So if he thinks I'm faking it, I kind of decided that I needed to call rather than go just go home I needed to call a team meeting with the relay boys and see what they feel and if they want me to stay I'll stay and if they want me to go I'll go it was one of those situations where yeah I just felt right the right thing to do in this situation is to have a conversation with the guys who right. are part of the relay team and if they want me to stay I'll stay and if they want me to go I'll go and you know we know what they decided so it was their decision why I end up winning Olympic gold or why I end up being a part of that team. Um, so but of, what, what, once they made that decision, the team spirit was unbreakable. That's the way I felt. Right. I kind of felt, once they said that they wanted me to stay, I felt we'd win. I, I just had this belief. Otherwise, why did I go through all that? Why did I yeah. go through all those situations? Why did I keep battling through the injury? Why, 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 why? So yeah, I had the belief after that team meeting that yeah, we could win Olympic gold. And so it was a very public um, exposure moment for your medical and therapy team because they needed to, to back you. Did you feel especially well supported by them? And, and, uh, and was, there, um, was that something that further strengthened those bonds? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Like I said, Brian English was at my wedding. So that tells you how strong a bond was created, you know, um, I don't get through it all. Um, okay, for Brian English to go and stand in front of the, the TV cameras and show my scam, that that shows you how much love and respect he had for me, not just as an athlete, but as a human being. So, again, how can I not go out and try? Um, that's the way I see it. A member of my team has that belief in me, so how can I not go out there and try and, and, and do my best? And this is why I say, if as a therapist, you understand your importance, and this isn't in an arrogant way, but your importance is vital. And as long as you see that, then, you know, you'll have moments where you're able to uplift an athlete that can't uplift themselves. Mm. I think that they, the team that, you know, it's really interesting that you just felt like once they'd made the decision for you to stay, the team spirit was so strong, then you just felt invincible. And, uh, and then if you can talk us, talk us through, it's not, not many opportunities that I get to ask this question, talk us through how you went about winning a gold Olympic medal. Like, <laughs> so, you know, let's, let me just give you the floor for that. Like, uh, take me, take me through it. Oh, oh. what I remember is, um, 
going out with the four guys. Uh, Jason Gardner was running first leg. Uh, I remember the gun going, um, him running around the bend. Um, the American I'm up against is Justin Gatlin. I remember taking the bat and just thinking, I need to get as close as possible to him. I need him to hear my footsteps. I need him to hear my breathing. I need him to gain some kind of doubt and understanding that although I didn't do well in the individual events, I'm in great shape. Um, as we as we're approaching the third leg run of Marlon Devonish, um, I can just see out the corner of my eye the Americans making a slight mistake. So I hand that baton over to Marlon Devonish as quickly as possible. He runs a fantastic bend and hands on the baton to uh, Mark Lewis Francis. And to be honest with you, once. I handed over the baton. Um, I didn't watch the rest of the race. I just dropped to my knees. I dropped to my knees and just started saying a little prayer. And the next thing I know, I get a tap on my shoulder from a Nigerian sprinter. And he just says to me, Darren, you're Olympic champion. And yeah, it's like, I just have this moment where everything's just flashing through my mind. The good, the bad, the ugly, everything. Everything I've been through, the ups and downs. And yeah. It culminates in me standing on the top of the podium like the dream that I had when I was 12. For, for, the, for those that maybe don't remember it or whatever, that, they, that American team, it, it's fair to say Bucky's favourites, right? You know, they, 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 yeah, they yeah, were, yeah, yeah. It was such yeah. a, it, odds on. And so the way that it all got situated, and like you say, corner of your eye and stuff is super relevant. And you guys, um, it, was, it was such a, again, another, I say about that, breakthrough moments in pop culture and stuff is that because it was, unexpected and, and not, not only had you been written off as a person but as a team it was like oh they'll drop it again and like the cynicism that rolled in across the press and stuff so really quite a cool cool thing even when I when I think back and also just the way in which it really was uh, you know, from what I could see looking on a really well-placed team in terms of uh, Gardner's running you know 60 meters faster than most at that point so he's particularly famed for being quick off the block you think about the balance of it in a team it's not yeah. just four individuals that let's cross their fingers they can do it it's like actually it's really well placed and 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 like you said Marlon on the bend it was just you know a really cool thing for for looking back especially after now knowing what happened it's it's quite nice when you think that was a moment in time that you guys stepped yeah. up and, and 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 fortunately got your got your rewards and was it was it a fun I told you so oh <laughs> uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, I never went to Michael Johnson and, and said those words because it's one of them. Once I won Olympic gold, there's no need. Um, I've achieved what I set out to achieve from a young age and all those that doubted me. Because by that point, there's so many people that have probably doubted you along your journey. Um, the list is long. So mm. it, it, eventually it's just... It's just one of those moments that you just you just don't forget. It's um, yeah. Well, the it's, accusation, it's the accusation, there was the accusation was that you were like a flake, and that, that there was this suggestion, an accusation that you that you weren't mentally strong enough, and that you were therefore feigning injury because you just weren't accepting your own performances, etc. And so that obviously was uh, that that toughness then shone through. And also from what we then from that point onwards, especially, but also then when you reflect on it through the book, it's kind of that that has meant that you've that that way in which you're driven just continues throughout and and especially from from that point and even beyond retirement it's sort of that grit is like the the the, the common the common feature is do you think that that's something that is almost trained from your experiences do you think that's just sort of your disposition as a character that you you, you kind of are gritty and determined and, and that wanting to prove thought wrong where do you think that, that comes from that hunger um, I think from my experiences, um, I, and I think um, I had a strong mother who um, would always try and, she, well, she what she would always say is, I will always listen. I may not do the right thing first time, but I will always listen. And the advice that was given is always there. <laughs> I may not do it the first, second or third time, but it's always there. And I just think it's like climbing a mountain. You know, um, every time you get a little bit further, you have the belief that you can get to the top and you get a little bit further and you gain more belief that you can get to the top. So it's always in stages. Um, 
So yeah, I would definitely say it's down to it's down to experience and trying to learn the lessons from those experiences, and then how can I put them into other aspects of my life? I think that becomes important as well. None of us are perfect, but as long as each day you're seeking perfection, then you're on the right path. Yeah. When when then? I mean, I know it's not as abrupt as this, as if I'm I'm I'm, I'm skipping a bit of a chapter. Obviously, if we if we were to suggest that Athens was 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 it, but when it comes to that, um, at least that starting to taper into the into towards the end towards your career, and that, that, that's where again in in the book you you describe that as being a real challenge trying to get your head around what it is that you wanted to do and achieve and and and, and things like that talk me through those things from from then onwards towards the end of your athletics career as to as to how you came to make the decisions you did yeah well i think athletics is physical and mental so you're never going to have something in your life that's probably as physical and mental again unless I set challenges like climbing mountains and different things like that, doing amazing walks for charities and different stuff like that. But always for me, it was important that I was able to give back, um, give back to kids from my background who don't have that belief in themselves. So I got involved in different charities like the Youth Sport Trust. I enjoyed mentoring. So I, I tried to give back by mentoring younger athletes, um, I used my experience um, to gain opportunities uh, as a pundit, um, working with the BBC, which I was able to yeah, still do to this present moment. Um, but I think one of the things that I enjoyed the most was coaching. Um, and again, through my relationships with Brian English, uh, he became a doctor at Chelsea and that culminated in me getting a phone call the one day and him saying, do I do any coaching? And I was like, well, no, but I I can <laughs> sure. um, and uh, he got me in to Chelsea to work with Andrei Shevchenko who had a few problems and that's when I understood again the greater relationship uh, with a therapist and a sports person um, understanding the body it's always as much as possible I would say as a therapist if you can help the athlete understand their body then the relationship that you'll have will be better um, mm. I think sometimes some therapists just say, do this, do that, but sure. they don't put it in a language where the athlete can gain understanding. I think I had so many therapists that I just gained a, a better understanding of the body, um, which is why I've been able to go in and help uh, athletes get over injuries from hamstring injuries, calf injuries and different things like that, because I know the right type of drill then that will help them heal quicker. Mm. Um, but that all comes from what I learned and learned from the good people that I worked with. Mm. Um, and I, I also set up a sports nutrition business. Uh, yeah, so I, try, I tried on retirement to just throw myself into as many things as possible mm. um, and as much as possible, make sure it was stuff that I loved and I enjoyed. Um, then it didn't feel like work. It just felt, it felt like a natural transition. I think the transition sometimes for any sports person can be difficult. Uh, but for me, I've just tried to spin as many plates as possible, but make sure everything that I was doing, I enjoyed. And yeah, my sports nutrition company, Profit Supplementation, that's been going now for 13, 14 years. So it's been great to be a part of that and help other sports people get the best out of themselves. You know, um, mm. I think when you've done it yourself, there's no greater feeling than playing a small part in helping somebody achieve their dreams and goals. Mm. In recent in, in recent years, and obviously you said at the start of this this show that uh, it's one of the things that really inspired you to make sure you got things down on paper. You faced some medical adversity and started to to, to just just introduce us a little bit to that, as well as then the circumstances that are getting through that. Um, yeah, I had a bleed on the brain um, in 2018. Not sure to this day what caused it, but uh, oh. Yeah, it was a scary situation. Um, had a seizure, uh, nearly bit off half my tongue. Um, but I think the scariest thing was just seeing the, the faces of my children and my loved ones. Um, and I think that's what gave me the strength to, to continue to fight and try and get better and try and be the best version that I could be after, after such a 
traumatic um, situation. Um, one of my good friends said to me that, you know, I have to treat what happened to me um, with it being the brain as if I've, I've damaged the muscle um, in my leg and I've just mm. got to be patient and retrain and reprogram. and Yeah, just take my time with it. I think that's the thing with someone like me. I just want to jump up like everything's okay because I've had so much adversity. <laughs> because of that, because of that, so much adversity in my life, mm. I, I, I always try and be uh, optimistic. Um, and like I say, uh, at times I can jump up quicker than maybe I should do. So yeah, with the brain injury, it's just been important that I take my time and and slowly heal. But it was a scary time. It was a scary time for the family. Um, mm. Not so scary for me, strangely enough, but it was scary for the family. Sure, and and it, but it, but it's clearly been a punctuation point in your life, which has made you then reflect on uh, what you then do from there, including writing writing this book. You feel like it, you kind book. of expose quite an exposing moment. Yeah, yeah, that's why I wrote the book. You know, um, going through that situation, it's it's like. Well, a lot of people will look at me and go, well, how have you got back from it so quickly? And if you read the book, that's how. <laughs> that's all I can tell you. Yeah. That's how it's... Um... Well, yeah, I mean, especially for a, th- a therapist audience, the the story of how Darren applies rehabilitation principles uh, in, in a really sensible format to aspire to get back to a functional level to do all the other things that he, he wants to do is is exactly testament to the, the the learning that he'd done throughout a career and so um, yeah. i hope that's not too much of a spoiler but an absolutely box office um finale to a to a box office book it's uh, it's been fascinating what a life you've you've lived and, and continue to live um and as as for those watching this uh we'll send you the the links that will be clickable for you to to sign up and uh, and and hopefully get first access to pre-orders on this this fantastic book as well as a chance to win a signed copy of it uh, that we're going to get Darren to, to scribble because he's as he said he's been practicing his autograph since he's 12 years old so he's pretty good at it now so we're going to get him to sign a book um thank you so much for your time really appreciate it just tell the oh, uh, listeners you. a little bit about where they can find out more about about you and social media handles that sort of thing yeah um my twitter is at campbell darren and uh you know what? I forgot what my Instagram is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm pretty <laughs> sure Darren Campbell will find it, won't it? That's the useful yeah. thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's yeah. cool. Um, but yeah, th- really appreciate it because bringing through not just next generations of therapists, but refining uh, the, the sort of medical team for us to learn more from, from stories such as yours and careers such as yours is super important. And, and so thanks for sharing that with us in this format. It's been, it's been fascinating. No, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Really enjoyed it.